there are two rampy. So Liz, if you want to introduce yourself and get us started, that sounds great. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Liz Rampey, and I am a Mars research scientist here at the Johnson Space Center. And I've worked here for a little over three years. Um, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, went to college at Colgate University in upstate New York, um, and then went to graduate school and studied geology at uh, Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. Um, here at the Johnson Space Center, uh, I'm a team member of the Mars Science Laboratory, and I'm also um, a team member of the Chemin instrument. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that instrument today. Uh, but this uh, photo on the left is of me with our laboratory version of Chemin. Um, I've also been really lucky to participate in analog or mock missions uh, to the moon and to asteroids. And this is a picture of me in a mock spacesuit um, in a uh, mock vehicle uh, that uh, we sort of pretended to take to an asteroid uh, to test different technologies and to examine how uh, people would eventually uh, go to an asteroid. So I've been uh, very lucky to be part of uh, missions like that. Uh, before we start uh, the main presentation about um, MSL and what Curiosity is found on the surface. I want to show you a quick video. Um, this is uh, late breaking news. I'm not sure if you guys heard about it, but on Sunday there was a very close encounter um, to a comet um, at Mars. It came about 85,000 miles um, within the surface, and I know that doesn't sound like very far, or it sounds like a long ways, but it's actually pretty close. It's about a third of the distance between Earth and the Moon. So I want to show you a little video on that here. Well, this is going to be an opportunity to observe a brand new comet, and we noted immediately that it's going to make a very close approach to Mars on October 19th. When we first heard about the comet and that it was coming very close to Mars, we had so little tracking information that there was a possibility it could hit Mars. The accuracy of the trajectory started to improve and we realized it wasn't going to hit Mars, but still might provide a threat to our spacecraft there. solar system from the Oort cloud that's coming in close to where we can see it and close enough that it's actually encountering Mars. Comets are very dusty. They spew off small particles of dust and gas, and that's what you see. So when you see the tail of a comet, it's dust and gas being coming off of the, the main nucleus. It's when Mars is closest to that trail of debris that is the most dangerous situation. It only takes a, a half a millimeter sized particle traveling at uh, 56 kilometers per second to injure one of these spacecraft. We're going to hide behind Mars. So kind of like diving under your desk, there's an earthquake and flying glass around. It's exactly the same sort of thing. We're not going to take any chances. We've taken uh, steps to make sure our orbiters are on the other side of Mars at the time. When Mars moves ahead and through the orbital debris of the comet, hide those spacecraft behind the planet itself. Take your observations, duck and cover. The rovers are safe, and Mars does have a, uh, an atmosphere that will protect it from the smallest particles. This approach to Mars gives us an opportunity to try to model the motion of this comet, find out uh, how well are we going to know where it is with respect to Mars at any given time, and so that will help us understand uh, the motions of other comets that may, uh, may approach the Earth. That day, when it goes by and the spacecraft starts sending their pictures down, all are happy and healthy, it'll be, you know, time for the champagne. And I actually did see a picture from one of the spacecraft that showed uh, the comet in the distance. So images were acquired, but the rovers, I'm sure, had a little bit of a view as well. So thanks for sharing that, Liz. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's pretty cool that um, uh, MSL Curiosity uh, can do some astronomy observations as well. And we know that all of the spacecraft are healthy. And yes, you're right, there have been images released. Um, I saw some from some of the orbiters. 
And so here's another example of uh, uh, an astronomical observation uh, from Curiosity. Uh, this little uh, dot here is actually um, that of, uh, it's the Earth here, this bright dot, and our moon. So pretty cool that uh, we can, uh, you know, see our home planet from Mars. But now let's get on to the main part of the presentation, um, Curiosity at the base of Mount Sharp. So Curiosity landed on August 5th, 2012, so a little over two years ago. And the first uh, Mars year, which is almost two Earth years, was the primary mission. So today I'll highlight some of those important discoveries that we made during the first Mars year. And then I'll go into some of the discoveries that we've made since. And so in the um, extended mission, which started at about uh, July 1st. So I'll talk about some of those discoveries, uh, talk about our arrival at the base of Mount Sharp, um, and what we are planning on doing next. I want to show you a video. This is called Dare Mighty Things. It's going to show you all the effort that went into building Curiosity um, it'll show you the really innovative landing system that Curiosity has and some of the first important discoveries that we made. And so this video also gives you a great overview of what's been happening, and then we'll supplement that with all the great information from Liz.
Because of that and the capability of this rover, we have this possibility for just monumental science accomplishments. Within two months, the team found an ancient riverbed, evidence of flowing water. We have found a habitable environment that is so benign and supportive of life that probably if this water was around and you had been on the planet, you would have been able to drink it. So a little taste of the excitement that really was generated not just before the mission, uh, but before, during landing, and then afterwards. And we're so lucky that Liz will share this more in detail with us today. So thanks for that video, Liz. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I always, I, I love watching that video because it's so inspiring. And yes, there was so much excitement during landing. So I'm going to highlight some of the, uh, some of the uh, science discoveries that you saw in that video. But before Curiosity was even built and before the instruments were chosen, NASA uh, you know, gave us a goal uh, that it wanted Curiosity to achieve. And Curiosity's main scientific goal was to explore a local region on Mars and uh, see if there was an, any evidence for uh, habitable environments. Uh, so it wanted to see if there could have been environments either in the past or in the present that could have harbored life or environments in which life could have survived. So let's think about what scientists mean when we say habitable environments. So I'm, I'm going to ask you guys a question, and I want you guys to think about it, discuss it. What are the minimal ingredients that are necessary for life to survive on a planet? So I've given you some options. Does, it, does life need A, water, B, protection from radiation, C, sunlight, D, both water and protection from radiation, or E, all of these? So I want you guys to think about it. I want you to put your answers in the chat window, and I want you to explain your answers. So why do you think life needs A, B, C, A, and B, or all of these to survive? All right, so we'll let you do some thinking, and again, don't just give us a letter, give us your thoughts on why that answer is appropriate as well, and we'll see what we come up with. All right, so right away we're getting from Bonham that E, except that things live on the ocean floor, so maybe A and B, so they're actually thinking and reasoning out some of their thoughtful answers, so that's a great start there from Bonham Middle School in Texas. I'm sure others are discussing. We'll see what they come up with. And, you know, these aren't easy questions. Uh, so we, we in, intend for you guys and are knowing that you guys are out there discussing. So Lynn Haven in Florida thinks E, all of the above as well. We have to have sunlight and protection from the radiation or we can't survive. And water is essential. Desert Mountain in... Arizona believes E as well. We need all of those things in order to be able to survive. So life is, in, in the opinion of at least these three groups, needing a whole lot of what we have on our list. Murfreesboro from Illinois says D. Some things don't need sunlight, but they do need water and protection from radiation. So I think we've heard almost from all of the groups that are on the line. And uh, Liz, I think some of them have touched upon what the actual answer really is. Yeah, you guys are, are, are pretty bright. Yeah, uh, Murfreesboro and Bonham, you have the right answer. Uh, life as we know it on Earth needs at least water and protection from radiation, which can damage cells. Uh, we also need chemical elements that are required for life, and these include carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So we have instruments on Curiosity that can detect water, that can determine the radiation environment, and can search for all of these elements. So if you, if you think about it, you know, uh, Bonham and Murfreesboro were on the right path. Some organisms on Earth don't require sunlight, and you guys got it. You know, those organisms at the bottom of the ocean, you know, you've seen those pictures of 
scary looking anglerfish or those weird, creepy, frilly creatures. Uh, those don't need sunlight to survive. Uh, there are also um, some really extensive microbial communities uh, that live on deep sea hydrothermal events. And this is where um, uh, hot water and elements are released at near the bottom of the ocean uh, from volcanic activity near the, near the um, base of the crust. And so these organisms use the chemicals that are released or the elements that are released uh, to, pro to produce energy. And so those microbes are called, auto or are called chemotrophs. So now that you know the goal of Curiosity, I'll just introduce you to some of her instruments. I'll start up at the top. Uh, this is uh, ChemCam at the top. It uses a laser to ablate um, or zap a rock or soil and create a plasma, which it measures and determines the chemistry. Below it uh, is MassCam. That's a uh, camera that provides us really beautiful images of not only uh, outcrops and soils, but also of panor panoramas of Mount Sharp and the surrounding terrain. Uh, going into the body of the rover, we have SAM, which can tell us about the chemistry and isotopes in rocks, soils, and the atmosphere. We have ChemIn, and that's the instrument that I work on. Uh, it tells us about the minerals in rocks and soils. We have RAD, which determines the radiation environment. If you go out to the arm, there's APXS, which can also tell us chemistry. We have MOLLE, which is like a really powerful uh, magnifying glass or a hand lens. And then we have the, the sample handling system, including the drill, scoop, brush, and sieve. So I want to show you a little bit, uh, um, a cartoon about ChemIn to show you how we accept a sample and how we analyze a sample to determine the minerals in rocks and soils. So in the video, you'll see a powdered sample come out of the arm. So that's from the sampling handles, handling system. Uh, the sample goes into a sample cell. That sample cell is put into position in front of an X-ray beam. X-rays are transmitted through the sample, and we vibrate or move the sample around. And as those X-rays go through the sample, they're diffracted into these concentric rings. And the position of those rings is dependent on the geometry of the minerals and the atomic arrangement within those minerals. And so each mineral has a distinctive or unique concentric ring pattern. And so based on those ring patterns, we can say what minerals are in the sample and how much of each mineral is present. And keep that in mind. You'll see a picture of that later as well. Yes. Uh, this is an image that came from Molly, which is that hand lens or magnifying glass on the rover's arm. And this is an image of a conglomerate. And a conglomerate is a sedimentary rock that has grains with very diff many different uh, particle sizes. And so you'll see very, uh, uh, a lot of different particle sizes here. And here's a penny for scale. Um, so you can see the size of grains that Molly can see. Uh, and actually, Molly can image down to about 60 microns. And that's about the width of a human hair, so very fine scale. Curiosity landed in Gale Crater, and Gale Crater is 150 kilometers in diameter, or about 90 miles. And uh, it contains a mound of layered rocks in the center that's about five kilometers, or three miles tall. And the, we landed here because the rock layers, or the strata, in the lower sections of the mound show variations in the minerals that are present and the textures um, and the types of minerals that we see indicate that there could have been water here a long time ago. So thus, there could have been a habitable or different habitable environments here. And this black oval or ellipse here is the landing ellipse. And this is where the engineers predicted that Curiosity would land 
with a 99.9% chance. And uh, this landing ellipse is about uh, five miles from the base of Mount Sharp and those really interesting rocks that have different minerals that we're interested in. From orbit, using pictures and infrared spectroscopy, we saw evidence for an ancient river and a debris fan or delta on the crater floor. Uh, so we saw evidence for liquid water um, here before we even landed. And uh, this image over here shows where we find those um, minerals that form in water, including clay minerals at the bottom and then sulfate salts just above those clay minerals. Now I have another question for you guys um, to think about and discuss. If the interesting rocks that have the clay minerals and sulfate salts are at the base of Mount Sharp, why do you think that Curiosity landed so far away from the mountain and had to drive five miles to get to those interesting rocks? So as you think about that and put your answers in the chat window, be sure to give us your good explanation as to your thoughts on that. So we'll let you think about that and we'll see what answers come in. So as we have some answers coming in, Bonham Middle School is mentioning so they can land on a flat surface and not damage the rover or any of the surface they want to examine. Desert Mountain in Arizona says it's a safe place to land, so we got some engineers there. Lynn Haven is mentioning that so it wouldn't crash into the bottom by accident. And Murfreesboro is mentioning that it's safe and flat and easier for landing. So we have some engineering thinking types of people out there. Yeah, we do. And you guys got it right. Uh, the terrain at the base of Mount Sharp is very dangerous to land on or would be very dangerous to land on. And I'll show you some pictures of it. Uh, there are some really steep slopes and there are a lot of rocks. And so if we tried to land there, you know, Curiosity could have tipped or even flipped over, and that would have ended the mission before it even started. And here I want to show you another video uh, that will show you um, what Curiosity did during its first Martian year, um, including finding a habitable environment. And also we'll show you some uh, of the problems that we've had with the wheels and how we're solving those problems. So let's check out the first year. I'm Ashwin Vasavada, Deputy Project Scientist. I'm Matt Heverly, a rover driver, and this is your Curiosity Rover Report. Curiosity has been on Mars for one Mars year. That's 687 Earth days. Our goal over that time was to find a habitable environment, and we did. We found a lake bed on Mars that we drilled into and found the ingredients and conditions that could have supported microbial life if life ever was on Mars. It hasn't all been smooth sailing for the rover on Mars. After we left Yellowknife Bay where we did our first drilling, we noticed that the wheels were taking much more damage than we had expected. Sharp embedded rocks in the surface of Mars were really giving trouble to our wheels. We think we understand what's causing those holes from a lot of tests that we've done here in the Mars yard and a lot of analysis of the terrain from our orbital images. One of the other things we've done here in the Mars yard to understand the wheel wear issue is we built a half of a rover that we're driving over the simulated terrain. So we can watch how the wheels really wear. We think we've got new techniques to be able to drive the rover safely and identify some safe paths. Using our new driving techniques, we made it to a site called the Kimberley, where Curiosity drilled its third drill hole of the mission. We drilled into a site where water flowed across the surface and deposited a series of sandstones. We drilled into one of those sandstones, acquired rock powder, and fed it to our two analytical laboratories located inside the rover body. While the rover was at the Kimberly doing its drilling campaign, it even took some time to take a selfie. It reached out its robotic arm, just like me with my camera phone, and it used the Molly to take a series of pictures that it stitched together to take its self-portrait. The rover took a selfie before drilling and after, so you can even see where it drilled a hole on Mars. 
As we drive from the Kimberley to Murray Butte at the base of Mount Sharp, we tried to identify the best path for the rover. This means driving through sand. We took the Scarecrow rover to the Mojave Desert. We drove over similar sandy terrain to make sure that we know what's going to happen once we get there. The focus of the mission is really now on driving as we approach the base of Mount Sharp. In our first Martian year, we've driven almost eight kilometers of total distance with the rover. We get a little bit closer to the base of that mountain every day. Over the next few months, the science team is really excited to get to Mount Sharp, where we think the layered rocks there have captured the major climate changes in Mars history. We can't wait to get there and figure it all out, but it's going to take a lot of driving. You ready, Matt? Ready. Let's do it. Pretty amazing video and shots of what's been going on with this first year on Mars. So thanks again, Liz, for that video. Yeah, of course. So I'm going to highlight um, especially the results from Yellowknife Bay and the Kimberley. But uh, let's start with when we landed. This is the first um, mosaic of Mount Sharp from MassCam, uh, showing you uh, the scours from the descent rockets from when we landed. Um, also showing you Mount Sharp looking beautiful in the background. And these dark sand dunes here is close to where those rocks were at the base of Mount Sharp that we were targeting. Um, and again, that was about a five mile drive. This image was taken from High Rise, which is a camera on an orbiter, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, and it shows you where we landed. Um, and when we landed, we decided uh, to drive to Yellowknife Bay uh, and check out the rocks here. You can see the rover tracks. You can see Curiosity here. Um, and uh, so actually Yellowknife Bay was in the opposite direction of Mount Sharp. Mount Sharp is actually down here uh, to the southwest of this image. So I have another question for you guys to think about and discuss. Yellowknife Bay was in the opposite direction of Mount Sharp, where all of those interesting rocks with sulfate minerals and clay minerals are. So why do you think the scientists, why do you think we decided to drive to Yellowknife Bay and analyze the rocks here instead of going to Mount Sharp immediately? So discuss that in your respective classes, and we'll see what kind of answers and explanations we get from you. All right, so as we have some answers coming in, Lynn Haven is saying maybe to compare and contrast the minerals from Yellowknife Bay compared to um, Mount Sharp or perhaps some other locations. Desert Mountain in Arizona saying to see the different kinds of rocks. Murfreesboro in Illinois, they were looking for a particular rock but wanted to see how the rover would work, so perhaps giving it some practice driving. Bottom here in Texas is saying to examine the rocks to say if they were different in composition. Love the wording and the explanations that we have from the different groups and their contributions there. So it's all it seems like they're looking at looking at different rocks. So is that right? Yeah, those are great answers. Uh, and you guys are are exactly right. There are actually two reasons we went there. Uh, there were three different geologic units that converge here at Yellowknife Bay. So we had this bright fractured unit, uh, we had this cratered unit, and then we had this hummocky terrain here. Um, and so we went there because we knew that we could test the geology, the composition, figure out the minerals of three different rock units all in one place. Another reason is that on Mars, uh, clay minerals um, which, are, which form in water, are commonly found in white fractured terrains like you see here. So we thought that there might be a chance that we could find some clay minerals here and evidence for a habitable environment. On our way to Yellowknife Bay, we saw evidence for water um, in these conglomerates. 
So conglomerates, again, is a sedimentary rock with different particle sizes. And the size of these pebbles and sand and the roundedness of the grains indicates that they were deposited in a river or a stream that was ankle to hip deep. This is an image from Yellowknife Bay, and you can see two of the different rocks here. Uh, there's this gray ledge forming unit here, and then here's that white fractured unit. And a closer look at that white fractured unit uh, showed that it was a mudstone, meaning that the grains were very, very small. And we also saw these bright white veins moving through the mudstone. So this is an image from Mars. This is an image from Earth on the right showing similar uh, white veins. We zapped these veins with ChemCam using that laser, and the chemistry showed that it was made, these are made of calcium sulfate salts indicating that water was moving through here and precipitated those salts. Here's another image from our drill site. This again is of that mudstone which we named sheep bed. And you can see that there are these raised features uh, moving through uh, this rock indicating that water moved through here. Here's an image of the, the drill site and what we were really interested uh, when we saw this picture was that the sediments that are buried aren't red. They're actually gray, uh, indicating that these sediments uh, were not very oxidized. And so the, the image on the left shows you what that drill looks like, and here you can see that uh, sample in the scoop uh, before it was delivered to Kemen and Sam inside the rover. These are some of those images from Ken Min. Uh, on the left is uh, an image that was, or is uh, x-ray diffraction pattern of a sand dune that we called rock nest. On the right is that sample from the mudstone. And while these images might look very similar, there's a really important difference, and that's down here. You can see this broad, or diffuse ring down here, and that's evidence for the clay minerals. And by looking at this pattern and analyzing it, we determine that there's about 28% clay minerals, which again indicates that there was once water here. Based on all the evidence that we took at uh, Yellowknife Bay, we saw that there was uh, very likely an ancient habitable environment here. So the regional geology and the fine grain nature of that mudstone indicates that uh, it was at the end of a river system and there was once a lake bed here. The mineralogy, including the presence of clay minerals, indicates that there was water here for a long time and that that water was not too acidic or alkaline, it wasn't too salty, and uh, the conditions were not very oxidizing. And we also saw the chemical ingredients for life, including carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And the, um, the geochemistry that we saw also indicates that these elements could have been used um, by uh, primitive microbes as a source of energy. Another interesting um, experiment that we did on this mudstone is we did age dating on it using SAM. And those age dates showed that the mudstone was first exposed on the surface at about 80 million years ago. So I have another question for you guys. Uh, to give you an idea of how long 80 million years ago was, um, what was happening on Earth at the same time that this mudstone was exposed? And specifically, what organisms lived on Earth at the same time? I have a few uh, selections for you. A, nothing lived on Earth. It was a lifeless planet 80 million years ago. B, microbes were the only form of life on Earth 80 million years ago. C, dinosaurs walked the Earth 80 million years ago, or D, human for, humans first evolved 80 million years ago. 
So think about it and put your answers in the chat window. So probably no explanation or so, uh, but at least what do you think? 80 million years ago, we certainly weren't alive, or at least we're not that old ourselves, but <laughs> Desert Mountain is saying, see, dinosaurs walked the earth. So that's the, one of the first choices that has popped up from the participating groups. Bonham Middle School here in Texas seems to agree that dinosaurs were around 80 million years ago. Murfreesboro agrees. And we'll see what kind of answers we might get from Lynn Haven. So one of our groups from Lynn Haven isn't quite so sure. I mean, you think about 80 million years ago, that's a long time ago to think about. Uh, but it looks like even Miss Ackerlin's group from Lynn Haven there in Florida, they're kind of guessing, but they also think maybe C's the right answer. So what was happening 80 million years ago? You guys all got it right. You guys are some smart scientists. Dinosaurs walked the earth when this mudstone was first exposed to the sunlight. And uh, so 80 million years ago, Earth was in the Cretaceous period, and that's when horned dinosaurs like Triceratops lived. Uh, so if you think about it, you know, that rock was sitting on the surface uh, for the last 80 million years, and think about how much has happened on Earth since then. Dinosaurs went extinct, mammals evolved, humans evolved, all while the sheep bed mudstone was just sitting on the surface. So from Yellowknife Bay, we made a beeline to the rocks at the base of Mount Sharp. So we did have a few stopovers. We stopped at Darwin and Cooperstown to take images of some rocks and measure the geochemistry, uh, but our main stop was at the Kimberley, and we wanted to get to the Kimberley and do some really detailed analyses because this was an area that we saw from orbit that had four different rock types. But on the way to Kimberley, we went through a, uh, a pass that we called Dingo Gap. And so this is an image from Dingo Gap. Dingo Gap was, um, a sand dune in the middle of two little hills, and we were worried uh, that Curiosity might get stuck in the sand. But you can see that Curiosity made it through, and this image is of Curiosity looking back and seeing the dune that she just crossed. This is an image from the high-rise camera from, from orbit showing Curiosity right here at the Kimberley. So again, you can see the rover tracks as we moved around these, uh, uh, these hills here. And you can see that there are four different geologic units here. Uh, there's the unit that forms these um, hills. There's the unit below it that's light gray. There's this striated or striped unit. And then there's this dark gray unit here. This is an image that Curiosity took with MassCam of the Kimberley. And you can see these beautiful bedded um, sedimentary rocks. Um, and the, we saw that these um, sediments were a lot different than what we saw at Yellowknife Bay. The grain sizes were a little bit larger, indicating that there was more energy in this environment. So these rocks were likely deposited in rivers or streams instead of in a lake. We uh, drilled into uh, the fluvial sandstone uh, that we called Winjana. Uh, and fluvial just means that it was deposited in a river. And you can see that there are two drill, drill holes here. The sediments are still pretty gray, indicating they may not have been as oxidized as the surface. Um, and you'll see that there are two drill holes. We always do a mini drill or a test drill before we do our full drill to see if the rock is stable enough to support the drill. And you'll see that there was some slumping here, but not major. And so the rock was stable enough to support this full drill. And we saw some really interesting igneous minerals here that were very different from what we saw um, at Yellowknife Bay, indicating that there were two different igneous rocks that eroded to form the rocks that we saw at the Kimberley versus the rocks that we saw at Yellowknife Bay. One major milestone that we, um, we achieved at, on the last day of the primary mission is we crossed that landing ellipse, that um, black oval that I showed you um, early on in the talk. 
Um, you can see the, the rover tracks here. This is an image from the high-rise camera. Here's Curiosity. I've highlighted the edge of the landing ellipse here in yellow, and we just crossed it. So you'll remember that we had some holes in the wheels, or we do have some holes in the wheels. So to preserve the wheels, we wanted to drive over more benign or easier terrain, so terrain that didn't have a lot of rocks. And so we planned to come down here and drive through these valleys, down through Hidden Valley, Emigrant Pass, and Amargosa Valley to this um, region here called Pahrump Hills. And we wanted to go to Pahrump Hills because um, this is where different geologic units come together and there's this bright white fractured unit. And you'll remember that um, some of these units on Mars have clay minerals and so this could be another habitable environment. But we did have some problems when we entered Hidden Valley and tried to drive through that sand. Our wheels um, slipped a lot and we didn't want to risk getting stuck so we had to reverse and uh, drive to the north of Hidden Valley on some pretty rocky surfaces, but we made it through without too many holes in our wheels. I have another question for you guys. Why do you think Curiosity had so much trouble driving in this sand in Hidden Valley, but didn't have any trouble driving through the sand that we saw at Dingo Gap? So I want you guys to put your answers in the chat window and explain those answers. That'll be interesting to see what kinds of answers they come up with. So what was the issue here in your opinion? All right, so after some discussion, we're getting some answers in from some of the groups. One of the groups there in Lynn Haven said because the sand was softer. Desert Mountain is thinking the sand was less stable. Miss Ackerland's group there at Lynn Haven says that one of the students there says the rover is heavy and it would sink into the sand. Since they went to the other side, it was rockier and it wouldn't sink perhaps. And Bonham Middle School says there's a ton of sand there. The sediment is very soft and has finer particles. So some pretty interesting related answers there. So what do you think, Liz? Yeah, good, good, good explanations, good answers. But actually, we still don't know. We're still trying to figure it out. You know, since we are scientists, we have some hypotheses. Um, and like Bonham Middle School said, um, you know, there's a lot of sand there. So maybe the sand is deeper and is giving the rover some trouble. Or maybe uh, the sand has a different composition. Maybe it is uh, softer or stickier. Uh, so we're going to test these ideas at Pahrump Hills, where we are now. We're going to test the sand there. And also, we're going to take the, um, the mock-up rover called Scarecrow out into the desert and try and uh, figure this out um, here on Earth. And even Murfreesboro said it kind of looks like it's wetter, even though yeah. they realize there's no water there. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, there could be minerals there that have water um, and, and cause the rover to get uh, stuck or slip. Uh, so now uh, the biggest milestone, uh, we reached the rocks at the base of Mount Sharp um, about a month ago. So I'm going to have... Katie Stack explain um, our arrival and how we determined that we were finally there. And take note of the gorgeous images that you're going to see here as well. Hi, my name is Katie Stack, and I'm a Curiosity rover mission scientist here at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And this is your Curiosity rover report. After two years and nearly nine kilometers of driving, we finally arrived at the base of Mount Sharp. Before we even arrived at Gale Crater, we used our orbital images to begin our exploration of Mount Sharp. What we found was an important boundary, separating the sediments of the Gale Crater floor and the layers of lower Mount Sharp. The rover is now here at this important boundary. An earlier path to Murray Butte would have delayed our arrival at lower Mount Sharp. However, a couple of months ago, we decided to take a different path because it was more scientifically interesting, and that brought us to Pahrump Hill, we were encountering the rocks of Lower Mount Sharp nearly two kilometers before we originally expected. This bright outcrop is Pahrump Hills, 
It's about 15 meters across. At this location, we're looking forward to obtaining our first drilled sample of lower Mount Sharp. And while we're excited about what we may find here, our exploration of Mount Sharp is really just beginning. As originally planned, we'll be exploring Mount Sharp layer by layer. Along the way, we'll be encountering a number of interesting geologic features where we're looking forward to continuing our search for ancient habitable environments in Gale Crater. This has been your Curiosity Rover Report. Check back for more updates. All right, so we are at the base of Mount Sharp. Yes, we are, and I want to show you uh, that map that Katie showed you, again, um, showing the uh, boundary, which is this white dotted line here, between the rocks on the Gale Crater Plains and the rocks uh, at the lower uh, base of Mount Sharp. And so we're at Pahrump Hills here, and you'll see that we are right on that boundary. And if we had taken that northern route, we would have, um, uh, it would have taken us a lot longer uh, to get to that point. So we are super excited to be here. And again, here is that image of Pahrump Hills. It's this right outcrop here, and you can see Mount Sharp in the background. And again, check out those um, steep slopes, those canyons. You guys answered that question um, early in the talk uh, about how it wouldn't be safe to land here, and look, it does not look safe at all. Uh, we drilled into this rock. Uh, you can see that these sediments are a little more brown um, rather than gray, so maybe these sediments are a little more oxidized than what we've seen before. We do see textural evidence for water at Pahrump Hills. Uh, we see these white veins here in these fractures that we've seen before, especially at Yellowknife Bay. And there are these really interesting resistant clusters that are about um, an inch across. And uh, these look sort of similar to um, some uh, features that we see on Earth that form from liquid water. And we're still analyzing the chemistry and the mineralogy of these rocks to determine if this was a habitable envi environment, so stay tuned. Um, but one thing that you guys can do at home is you can look at these images too. Um, if you go to mars.jpl.nasa.gov slash MSL, all of the images that we take down are, are put on that website. So you can check out these beautiful views of Mount Sharp, Pahrump Hills, and everywhere we go from here, and I encourage you to do so. So we're, we're uh, planning on doing a really extensive study of Pahrump Hills, really getting um, a good look at all of those rocks, testing the geochemistry and the mineralogy, sort of like a field geologist would. But from Pahrump Hills, we're going to continue our way up Mount Sharp. We're going to cross through these dark, um, Aeolian sand dunes, and then we're going to come up to this feature here um, that we call the hematite ridge. And hematite is an iron oxide mineral uh, that can form in liquid water, so we think that this could be another habitable environment. And once we get up through the hematite ridge, uh, we'll get into these clay bearing, um, clay mineral bearing rocks here, and then we'll continue up into these sulfate salt bearing. Uh, units uh, so that we can <clears throat> test which of these rocks uh, may have been habitable environments or may preserve organic carbon and the building blocks for life. And we're going to test to see how those environments and um, that water that was here uh, varied through time. So please stay tuned for more discoveries. Uh, we are in a, a, a great part of the mission where we're finally to these really interesting rocks at Mount Sharp. So we'll be sampling a lot more, and uh, there will be a lot more discoveries. Excellent. So first of all, thank you so much, Liz, for sharing the current discoveries with us because, you know, it is really pretty much an honor to be able to have someone like Liz take time out of her busy day to share all of this great information with you. So thank you very much, Liz. And second of all, thank you very much, to students and teachers, for connecting with us. Uh, we are so glad that we're able to share this with you. And we will continue to give you more discoveries and share more discoveries either through future presentations with Liz 
or even through any of our social media sites that Liz has helped provide some contributions related to Mars related stuff and we'll continue to do that as well. So you can certainly feel free to check out some of that and follow along with us. But for now, it is almost, it's about five minutes to the top of the hour. So hopefully you can stick around for a few minutes or more for some extensive Q&A or questions and answers. What we want to do is we want to share Liz with you so you can, you've seen her in still pictures here, but we want you to see her in real life. So we can, although we can't see you, Liz, you can give a little shout Hi. out and a hello to everybody there. So uh, while we're checking out Liz and while we're going to ask her some questions, uh, feel free to use the chat window to put in some questions that you might have about anything related to the Mars mission, MSL, Liz and her career. And I'm going to start actually with a question that I did see come in from Ms. Ackerlin's group. They were noticing, and this is a really great observation, that on some of the images, Liz, you pointed out where you could see the rover tracks, but sometimes you couldn't see them. Why is that harder rock, or why couldn't you always see those tracks? Yeah, that's a great question, and you guys are, are right that some of these rocks are harder than others. And also on Mars, we have a lot of loose sand and sediment that's been blowing around for billions of years. And so um, when we drive through that sand, um, it's like, you know, when you're driving on Earth and you drive through sand, you can see your tracks behind you. Excellent. So it is pretty cool that you can actually see those tracks and the rover from these orbiters from oh, space. Oh, yeah. It's Just amazing. Totally amazing. So Desert Mountain, Liz, is wondering, have you ever been to space? No, I haven't, but it would be so cool. Um, I, I would go to Mars in a heartbeat. Um, uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm not an astronaut, um, but we do have a lot of astronauts here at the Johnson Space Center. And the neat thing is, as you remember from Liz's picture, she has participated in simulations right. of going to places like an asteroid. So although she hasn't been to space, she has simulated what it would be like in some instances, which is really pretty cool. Yeah, and we simulate that with, um, it's sort of like a, it was sort of like a, the ultimate video game. You know, it was a uh, virtual reality and we were able to uh, fly a vehicle up to an asteroid uh, to sample the asteroid. We were able to put on um, a virtual reality goggles and gloves and sample the surface of the asteroid. It was pretty fantastic. So astronaut or not, our scientists actually have those experience or have the potential to be a part of those things, which really will help prepare and pave the way for those future astronauts that do visit these sites like Mars or an asteroid. So here's a question from uh, Lynn Haven, and they're wondering how do you name these areas on Mars? One of the names they noticed was Nopa Range and some of the others that were out there. So how do you come up with those names, and do you know anything about Nopa Ridge? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. And so, um, for each uh, section of the map, or each section uh, of Gale Crater, we have a theme. Um, and I don't know the size of each quadrangle, um, but it's probably you know hundreds of meters by hundreds of meters, maybe a kilometer by a kilometer. Um, but we have a theme, and so the theme right now uh, for the quadrangle that we're in is uh, places in the Mojave Desert um, in California and Nevada. So Pahrump Hills is where we are right now, and Pahrump is a, a city in, uh, in southern Nevada, so near the Mojave Desert. Um, another... I don't know where Nopa range... If, 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 it, was a, if it was a recent... Um, uh, name, then it's probably someplace in the Mojave Desert. It's in Northern California. Oh. It looks like it's a mountainous range um, in a valley in, southern, oh, yeah. in Northern California. Yeah, so it looks like it's in the, um, uh, yeah, it looks like it's in the desert. So, oh, Death Valley. Um, so, yeah, so the, the uh, theme right now is places or uh, cities in uh, Death Valley. Um, uh, another theme was uh, 
places in the Northwest Territory of Australia. So that's where Darwin is um, and the Kimberley. Uh, another theme was towns in upstate New York, and so that's where Cooperstown was. Um, but yeah, so that's how um, they get their names. And there are people on the team who are designated to find these places. And we've had some pretty interesting ones. Like one uh, target recently was uh, uh, Chocolate Sunday Mountain, which sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> so these are not official names, but why is it important to give names to these locations as they have been? Right, it, it, they aren't official names, uh, but it's important so that we can go back and say, oh, you remember that rock that we analyzed called, you know, Confidence Hills, which is what we're analyzing right now. Um, if we just called it rock number one, rock number two, it'd be, uh, it, it wouldn't be as easy to recall it. And actually, related to that, Ms. Ackerland's group there at Lynn Haven are wondering, so once these places are named, does the whole world of scientists use those same names, or do other countries have different names? That's a good question, and uh, yes, all, all the scientists will use these names, even though they aren't um, official. We do have some official names, um, especially for larger features on Mars. Um, and we generally name those after past scientists. Awesome. So also from Ms. Ackerland's group there at Lynn Haven, uh, one of the students, Donovan, wants to know if there is any oxygen at all on Mars, and if there is enough to have microbes there possibly even now. That's a great question. Um, there is a very small amount of oxygen on Mars. Uh, the atmosphere of Mars is much thinner uh, than that of Earth. It's about one percent of that of Earth, and the the type or the uh, abundances of the gases are uh, a little different. So, you know, on Earth we have a lot of nitrogen and then oxygen. On Mars we have a lot of carbon dioxide or CO2. Um, there are some organisms that. Uh, don't need oxygen to survive. Some of them are anaerobic. Um, uh, so, but the biggest uh, obstacle to microbes on the surface of Mars today would be that radiation environment. Um, the atmosphere here on Earth protects us from those high energy particles from space and from the sun. Uh, but since Mars doesn't have that atmosphere like we do, it has only a very thin one, um, there's a lot of radiation that reaches the surface and could damage and kill microbes. So great question and great answer. And here's another one from Bonham Middle School. So with relation to all of this research on Mars, they are interested in knowing what applications does the research on Mars have on Earth? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and that's something that I'm going to have to think about. Um, a, a big scientific question, uh, this is getting a little philosophic, but is we want to know if we're the only organisms um, in the solar system, in the universe. Uh, and so since we see all of this evidence for water on Mars, we see that Mars was very similar to Earth in terms of geology and geologic processes. It seems uh, feasible that organisms could have evolved, could have survived on the planet. And so being able to find these organisms, which Curiosity can't do, we can only look for habitable environments, but future missions, um, will help us answer whether or not there were organisms on Mars. Um, but being able to answer that question would be um, a, a huge scientific discovery and would help us understand our place in the solar system and in the universe. And so this whole idea of life and has life ever evolved anywhere else in our solar system is a very important part of research. Would you also say that understanding the geology of Mars and looking at its history through time can help us think about potential changes to things even on our own Earth? Is that a possibility as well as we look to the future of Earth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, one of these big transitions that we're looking at 
is um, the loss of the atmosphere on Mars. So what happens when atmosphere is lost or what happens when it changes and, um, to the environment? And that, that could be applied to here on Earth. Um, you know, what will happen to Earth, um, you know, millions, maybe billions of years in the future when um, we lose our magnetic field, when we lose our atmosphere. Awesome. So very thought-provoking question uh, from the group there. Now, related to, you talked about microbes and things, and so Ms. Ackerlin's class, and in particular Ashley, is wondering about if there's evidence for microbes that lived in water, uh, wants to know if there was evidence that microbes lived in water when it was once on Mars, because obviously it looks like there was a lot of water on Mars, so any evidence of microbes in the, in the past? We don't really have any evidence yet. Um, there have been some studies looking at Martian meteorites. So those are rocks that are from Mars um, that were ejected off of the planet uh, when um, a bolide, like an asteroid or a meteor, hit Mars. Those rocks were ejected. They came to Earth, um, and we've analyzed them here. And there are some interesting-looking um, uh, features in these rocks that some have said could be evidence for microbes, um, but that's the closest we've come uh, to finding microbes on Mars. Uh, the SAM instrument on MSL has found organic molecules, and organic molecules are the building blocks for life. Uh, so uh, we know that those building blocks exist. Great question, and a very controversial in the sense of a very hot topic in the scientific community, because once you do say a discovery of some sort has been made, you do have to back it up with evidence, and there's been certainly a lot of back and forth on, you know, what, uh, what some of these features actually mean. So it's an ongoing thing to, to certainly think about and look at. It's a really good question. Now, Desert Mountain in Arizona wants to know, Liz, uh, Seth in particular wants to know, do you work with uh, any people in space, or do you know any people that are in space or have been in space? I, I do know uh, some astronauts. Uh, I have met some. Um, I don't work with anyone um, on the International Space Station, but I do have a lot of friends who work um, with the people on the International Space Station. Um, so yeah, it is really cool working here at NASA that you you know you can be out walking around and run into an astronaut, or you know you can talk about the International Space Station and the latest research that's going on. Um, so it is um, it's a really exciting place to work. And we do have other people here within our group that do actually work with and train the astronauts. Mm -hmm. Some of the pictures you might see behind Liz are actually pictures that were taken by astronauts on the International Space Station. So um, other aspects of our group, we actually work with them a little bit more closely, communicate with them on a daily basis to ask them to take imagery of the Earth from the ISS for scientific purposes. And school groups even have the opportunity, and some of you are aware, to put in requests to have those astronauts take images of parts of the Earth for purposes of research you might do, be doing in the classroom. So we highly encourage you to think about that, because uh, it's probably your closest way of being able to sort of say, hey, an astronaut picked up a camera on the ISS for us. Because those people there in Aries, they actually asked them to, because we asked for that in, in terms of research. So, um, yeah, it is a very interesting and neat place to work here at JSD. Now, one of the students there at Lynn Haven, Daja, she wants to know, Liz, what's it, what's it like being a scientist? That's a, that's a great question, Daja. Um, it's Great. Um, I, I, I love being a scientist. Um, I was always so interested in how the way or how our world works, so especially our natural environment. I was always really interested in animals and the outdoors and, um, you know, volcanoes, earthquakes. They were always really interesting. So, um, you know, learning about those in school um, and then being able to apply what I've learned and ask questions um, 
about Mars, about you know the minerals on Mars, and then being able to go into the laboratories and do research on them to help answer those questions and get us you know closer to um, to answering those questions is just it's it's really exciting and especially being part of uh, Curiosity, it's so cool to see the images that come down from Mars and to get data that are data from Mars and analyze that data. Um, I feel really lucky. It's always really exciting. So I, I love being a scientist. And you can probably just tell by looking at Liz and watching her as she talks about this. She's so passionate, and we're so very lucky to have people like her to share that passion with you guys. And you students out there, too, can be sitting in the same chair that Liz is in. I mean, think about one of the purposes of the videos that we showed were to not only share some of this great information that's being put out by some of the other scientists at JPL, but to show you some of those scientists and the fact that there are other young women and, and men out there that are all part of this mission. So picture yourself in one of those videos one day in the future, and it really could be you. Now, I know we've got one or two groups that are still on the line, and Murfreesboro has a few questions in here. They're wondering, uh, Liz, how many other rovers are on Mars, and will Curiosity ever see them or run across their path? That's a good question. So there are currently only two working rovers on Mars. Opportunity um, is at Meridiani Planum, and uh, Curiosity is at Gale Crater. There are two rovers on Mars that do not work anymore. Uh, Pathfinder, which is in Aries Vallis, and um, Spirit, which is at Gusev Crater. And all of these, I, I wish I had a map to show you where these, um, uh, where these rovers are, but they are very far from each other. Um, you know, we've only driven, you know, five or six miles over the course of two years. We would have to drive hundreds of miles to go see another rover. Uh, so unfortunately, we won't see them. Um, but we do talk to the uh, orbiters that are uh, going around the planet. That's how we relay our signals to and from Earth. Awesome. And, you know, there are a few other rovers that are sitting on the surface of Mars that are no longer working. Uh, but we try to actually, and it's too bad we don't have a map, but we do try to to put the rovers in different areas of Mars so we can get a really good idea of what Mars is like in various locations. Now, uh, Murfreesboro had another question uh, related to Mars, and that was this whole idea of water. Well, what, since there's no water on the surface now, what are the theories of where that water went? That's, that's an excellent question, and it's one that we still debate. Um, but we have a few theories of where it went. So you'll remember that uh, Mars's atmosphere is much thinner than ours, about 1% of what we have. Um, and that atmosphere is deep in water. Um, so when Mars lost its atmosphere about three and a half billion years ago, um, because of the loss of its magnetic field, um, that's when a lot of this water could have been lost to space. Um, this, some of this water was also locked up in ice. Uh, there are poles at there are uh, poles of water and CO2 ice uh, in the north and the south, and there's also subsurface ice, so water that's just beneath the surface in the soils um, near the poles. And actually, the Phoenix lander um, helped discover some of that ice um, uh, in 2007. It dug into the surface. Um, of the North Polar Plains and found that there was indeed ice in the soil. And another idea is that some of this water went into minerals. So the minerals like the clay minerals that we find in Gale Crater and the sulfate minerals, uh, some of those have H2O water or OH um, or hydroxyl groups in their structures. So a lot of that water could be held in those minerals. Excellent question and excellent answer. And actually, in looking at the chat window, I think we might have actually gotten most of the uh, questions answered. 
So we appreciate uh, you staying on the line and asking such great and thoughtful questions because they really, really are. And even your answers throughout the session today were really great as well. So with that, it is 15 minutes past the top of the hour. So I think we shall bring things to a close. And again, for those of you still on the line, thanks so much for joining us today. And again, we just want to make sure we say to Liz, thank you so much for sharing your passion and all of this great information about curiosity. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for staying on and asking these great questions. Um, and uh, keep going in science. Science is awesome. And I hope to see you in the next, oh, what would it be? 15 years here at NASA? There you go. There's a seat right next to Liz waiting for someone out there in a classroom to sit right next to her. So she wants to go to Mars and she doesn't want to go to, go alone. So we look forward to having you guys some someday. I bet at least a handful of you will be working at a NASA center, maybe here at the NASA Johnson Space Center. So thank you again so much for joining us. And with that, we'll, uh, we'll officially sign off. You guys have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye, guys.